Tonight's speaker is Pastor John Michael Becker. He's the director of Jerusalem Ministries, an orphanage ministry here in Korea, and he's the campus pastor of Shilin. Thank you, Brock. All right, it's an honor to speak Friday Fire here. It's been a while. Uh, tonight I'm going to be preaching part two to a sermon that I preached five years ago. <laughs> Hope you guys have been keeping up with your podcast listening. The title of tonight's sermon is Why Pray for Israel, part two. Why Pray for Israel, part two. So I preached... Uh, First sermon, Why Pray for Israel, back on October 15th, 2010. So if you want to listen to that, you can go back to the 2010 uh, year section on, on New Philly website. The only other sermon that's been preached on Israel, as far as I know, at New Philly, was Pastor Christian preached the message, The Future of Israel. And uh, that was on May 12th, 2013. That was part of his End Time series. And so you guys should listen to that one as well. It's a very important message, The Future of of Israel, May 12th, 2013. I want to just honor you guys for praying for Israel, especially those that came to the church after 2013 and maybe don't know why we're praying for Israel. I just want to honor you for obeying the Holy Spirit and just following the leading uh, here in this church. I pray that tonight you guys be refreshed, be strengthened, and that our heart for Israel uh, will really grow as the Spirit of God, His heart burns for these people. Uh, so let me say a prayer for us before we get into this message. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for tonight, Lord. I thank you that tonight is a special night. And uh, God, I just pray for your blessing, Lord, for your anointing to flow tonight, Lord, that you will bless these words, Lord, that you will bless, Lord God, uh, the, the different pictures, Lord, and maps, Lord, that your people are going to watch. And more than anything, Lord, that you may bless, Lord, your name in this place, that your spirit may stir in every person's heart, Lord, that we will know you more through tonight, that we will know your heart more through tonight, God, and that we will see the full redemption of your people, Israel. We bless your name. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You need me to move a little? Okay. There we go. All right, so I cannot sum up the first two messages. There's just too much. In those two messages. So I'm going to give you the extreme cliff notes. If you do not know what Israel is, uh, I'll give you guys just the very basic uh, background. I want to start with this message. The one thing you really need to know in regards to Israel is 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. And it's three words. It's love never ends. NIV says love never fails. Other translations, it's love never dies. God's love endures forever. We give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. His love is not temporary. Okay? His love is not conditional. His love endures forever. In Genesis 12, God chose Abraham. Out of all the people on earth, he chose this one man, Abraham. And then he chose Abraham's son, Isaac. And then he chose Isaac's son, Jacob. And to Jacob, he gave the promise that through your descendants, Jacob, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And later in Jacob's life, he changed his name to Israel. And that's where the Israelites come from. Later on, the Israelites would become known as the Jews, the people of Judah, the Jews. When Jesus came to earth, his mission was not for you guys. His mission was for the Jews. It was for the Israelites. In Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus' focus of his ministry was on the Jewish people to the point where when he spoke of Zacchaeus, one of the people he reached out to, he described him as a son of Abraham. In Luke 19, Jesus' heart was for the Jewish people. All of his disciples were Jewish. Jesus himself was Jewish. Jesus, he wept over Jerusalem. Jesus reached out to the Jews. He healed them. He ministered to them. He taught them. Jesus loved the Jewish people. 
It wasn't until after he was resurrected and the early church was formed that later God opened doors so that they could begin to reach the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people around the world. And that's how we've become saved. Because soon the Holy Spirit went out from Jerusalem and went to the ends of the earth. But God's heart, his love, it endures forever. His heart burns for Israel. And if we are truly plugged into his Holy Spirit, we'll catch it just like the Apostle Paul. This is a key verse right here in Romans 10, verse 1. It says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. There we go. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. This is the words of the Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you guys, if you have not meditated upon Romans 9, 10, and 11, you guys need to do that. I'm not going to be preaching from those past, that passage today. Uh, Pastor Christian covered it a lot in his message, message the future of Israel. Uh, but you guys need to meditate it on your own as well. This message tonight, though, it's going to be a little bit def different. Sorry, I'm, my, my mouth is getting a little dry. Uh, it's going to be more of a lecture. This AC is right on me. Um, it's going to be a little bit different, and so uh, I might go a little bit quickly. I want to encourage you guys, if, if you, you know, start to fall behind in terms of taking notes, it's fine. Just kind of sit back and enjoy the ride. There's going to be a lot of great pictures up here that will keep you, keep you going, all right? So let me start. I want to start with the history of Israel. So you guys can know, what, what are we exactly praying for? Where is it geographically? What's going on here? So let's show a map of the Middle East. This is the Middle East. And look, I got a pointer. All right. We got Iran. We got Iraq. We got Syria. We got Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. And then right here, this little nation is Israel. Now, God's heart burned for this land long before the Israelites existed. When God chose Abraham, he did not choose Abraham's land. He did not say, I have chosen you, Abraham, and your surrounding land. Rather, he says, I've chosen you, Abraham, and I've chosen a land for you to go to. If you didn't know, Abraham was from around here in Iraq, present-day Iraq. In his journey, he went up to Syria first, and then he went down into the promised land. And what I want you guys to catch tonight is that God's heart doesn't just burn for the people of Israel, it burns for the land as well. Look, I'm, I'm going to give you guys a bunch of verses. Just read along right here. Deuteronomy 11, 12. It says, a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it. Now, this is before Israel has entered the promised land. He's saying this. My eyes are always upon this land from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. No one Jewish is there. No Israelite is there. But he's saying, my eyes are always upon this land. 2 Chronicles seven sixteen, For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. For all time. Now, an interesting passage that you just got to read on your own is 2 Kings chapter 17. Israel is conquered by Assyria, and Assyria takes the Israelites out of the land of Israel into exile and resettles a bunch of foreigners into the land. But despite there not being Israelites there any longer, God's eyes are still upon the land. And he brings judgment upon the land because these new foreigners don't know how to worship him. You see, God's heart is not just with those, those Israelites that have been scattered. His heart also burned for that land. I'll show you some more verses. Psalm 48, verse 1 and 2. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion. In the far north, the city of the great king. Zion is the Lord's city, Jerusalem. Mount Zion is the tallest mountain in Jerusalem. Many people believe that was where the temple was. The temple mount was on Zion. Zion is dearly loved by the Lord. It's also dearly loved by New Philly. Three of our babies have the name Zion. <laughs> Olivia Zion, Neufeld, Ethan, Zion, Lee, and then Zion, Kim, in Pusan. Psalm 122, verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Isaiah 62, verse 1, he says, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet 
until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. Another verse, Isaiah 62, 6, 7. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in all the earth. Guys, in Matthew 5, 35, I didn't put it up here, but Jesus himself says Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Jerusalem is a city of God. Jerusalem was the one city that Jesus wept over. He wept over Jerusalem. God loves the Holy Land, and his promises are not false. Now, Satan knows God's heart for the Israelites. Satan also knows God's heart for the Holy Land. So Jerusalem, this one city that isn't that big, it has been destroyed twice in history, besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, and captured and recaptured 44 times. One city constantly under war. Now I'm going to give you the history of present-day Israel. So you guys are going to see how it's developed here. What's the background? Who are the Palestinians? Who are the Jews today living in Israel? The land surrounding Jerusalem has been conquered by different nations time and time again. Jerusalem was only controlled by Israel for short periods of time. The majority of the time, it was conquered by other empires. It's been controlled by 24 different countries and empires in its history. In the time of Jesus, in the early church, it was controlled by the Roman Empire. Around 600 AD, it just began being conquered by all sorts of different groups, including European crusaders who came in and tried to take the city. From 1260, so we're talking 1260, before America has been found, 1260 to 1517, the Mamluk Egyptian Empire controlled all of the Holy Land. It was a huge empire. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. The Mamluk Empire controlled it for about 300 years. Then from 1517 to 1920, the Turkish Ottoman Empire controlled all of the Holy Land. Okay? Throughout the centuries, there was no clear ethnicity or nationality in that land. The people were Muslims, the people were Jews, and believe it or not, the people were Christian in this land. It was just a land that had been conquered. It had no country's name. All right, when Korea was conquered by Japan, although Japan tried to change the name of Korea, we remained Korea. This land remained Korea. But for Israel, for thousands of years, it was just put under the name of a different empire and a different empire. Right, I'm going to show you a map of the Ottoman Empire at its peak. This empire was huge. And this empire lasted centuries. These were the Turks. Okay, this is from Turkey. And they controlled all of this land. They controlled it up until World War I. Most of this land they controlled. And then after World War I, the British took over Israel. So if we see this, the British owned all of this land. Many of these were not sovereign states after World War I. You can see the years when they became independent. 1922 for Egypt. 1930 for Iraq. Okay, but a lot of this land was controlled by the British Empire. Over here, this was France. Right here, that's Italy. Italy controlled that land. The British gave the land the name Mandatory Palestine. Now, it had been known as Palestine for some centuries. But it had been known as Palestine not as a country, but as a piece of land. Oh, that is the land area of Palestine. Much like we say, oh, that is the Saharan Desert or those are the Himalayan mountains. When we say the Himalayan mountains, we're not referring to a people group. When we say the Saharan desert, we're not referring to one country. It's just a landmass. And so that landmass for a long time was known as Palestine. And when the British took over that area, they called it mandatory Palestine. Once again, it was not all Muslim, it was not all Jew, it was Muslims, Jews, and Christians living in mandatory Palestine. Now, during the British occupation of Mandatory Palestine, there was a growing Zionist movement. They wanted their own state. And they began to push for getting land in present-day Israel. But the Arabs fought this severely. They did not want any Jews having any sort of country in that land. 
The British kept putting this off until after World War II. After World War II, there was the discovery of the concentration camps and all that the Jews had gone through, the millions that had died, and now hundreds of thousands of refugees. And so the pressure on, Brit on the British people was extremely high to give the Jews some sort of land. So finally, in it was 1947, British said, all right, we're giving up the land, and they gave it to the United Nations. The United Nations put it to a vote. Would they give a Jewish state or not? And it was passed that there would be a Jewish state. So next map. This is what the United Nations agreed to. They said that the red right here, I believe that's red, I'm colorblind, but uh, this, this color right here is a Jewish state. All right, you can see it's divided up in these different areas. This color, which I don't know, is an Arab state. Jerusalem was ruled by the United Nations. All right, so they're saying, look, this is just Jewish, Jewish state. Jews can be a sovereign state in this land. And it's, it's not even connected right here, barely connected right here. And then this land, all the Arabs, all the Muslims that are living in Palestine, they can have this land right here. The Jewish people celebrated this. They loved it. Okay? So the partition happened in 1947. Their Independence Day was May 14, 1948, according to the lunar calendar. So their Independence Day is different every year. They celebrated this greatly. But the Arabs hated this. The very next day, May 14th, Independence Day, May 15th, war. War broke out. It was the Arab-Israeli war, and it didn't look good for Israel. The countries that came against Israel included Egypt, what was known as Transjordan at the time. Syria also came across, all right, and all the Arabs in that land. They attacked Israel. Now, the CIA and the British government, they all assumed that Israel would be destroyed. They did not think that Israel could win this battle. Okay, uh, the Egyptians said it'd be over in two weeks. The Egyptians and the other Arab countries, they had air forces, tanks, and modern artillery. The Israelites, they didn't have anything. They didn't even have anti-tank weapons. All they had were just little guns. But they fought for their lives. They were surrounded by all these different sides, okay, by these forces coming up and coming in in all directions, and they knew if they lost, they could be annihilated. So they fought with all their might. And what was interesting was Israelites, Jews, just kept coming in. Although there was a war happening in 1948, 1949, Jews just kept coming from Europe. And they were immediately put into the army. Uh, next slide. Oh, all right, I missed this one. This is very important. Uh, let's go back to this slide right here, Isaiah 66. May 14, 1948 was a answer to this prophecy that was made more than 2,000 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. It reads this, who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in a day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. That's a powerful prophecy. Israel was formed in one day. And one day, suddenly, they had a sovereign state. This wasn't some long revolutionary war and then Independence Day. It was just boom. Here's the vote. It's yours. May 14th, 1948. All right, next slide. This is a picture of female Israeli soldiers, and they were no joke. You arrived in Israel, you were given a weapon, and you were trained for battle immediately. You had to fight for your life. And many of these women were experts in war. They weren't just given some gun. They went through a lot of rigorous training. Uh, and this still happens today. Many of the women still go to battle. Just like North Korea and South Korea, you have kunde, and you know, everybody has to go and, and fight for at least, or at least be a soldier for a couple years. The same happens in Israel, even today. The Israelis, thanks to all these refugees, quickly grew in strength, and they surprised the Arabs. And they won the war within a year. And they actually took 30% more of the land that the UN had given them. All right, and so next slide. Here's the new map. After the Arab-Israeli war, what you have here is this is all now Israel. It's all connected, and it's all up here. Right here you have the Gaza Strip. That's an important name to know. The Gaza Strip was controlled by the Egyptians. All right, this was not Palestinian land. This is Egyptian land right here, controlled by the Egyptians. This is known as the West Bank. Also, you should know that, West Bank, this was controlled by Jordan. 
So Jordan controlled this land and almost all of Jerusalem after the Arab-Israeli War. So West Bank, Gaza Strip. What's right here is a, a demilitarized zone, just like the DMZ up in North and South Korea. This was the same right here and up here in the Golan Heights. This is also another DMZ. It's a place where you weren't allowed to have battle. It's part of the treaty at the end of the Arab-Israeli War. So Israel had grown through that battle. During the Arab-Israeli War, about 750,000 Palestinian Arabs or Arabs living in this place were displaced. They became refugees. They fled to the Gaza Strip on the, right, uh, on the left and they fled to the West Bank on the right. They also tried to go to other Muslim nations, but interestingly, the Muslim nations would not accept people from Palestine. Only Jordan would accept them. At the same time, all the other Muslim states hated Israel and oppression began to happen to Jews living in the other countries. So while 750,000 Arabs in this land became refugees, 700,000 Jews in the other countries also became refugees as a result of this war. And all of them came to Israel. 100,000 alone came from the country of Iraq to get placed here in Israel. When Israel was formed, it had a population of 800,000. Within a few years, because of refugees, it had doubled to 1.6 million. Within a few more years, it would triple to 2.4 million. Israel has never been at peace. There has always been battles and skirmishes against this land, most notably in the 1967 Six-Day War and the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War. By 1967, the Egyptians had mobilized troops right here, and they were preparing for an invasion. Same with Jordan and Syria had also mobilized troops in this area. And in 1967, Israel, the people of Israel, knowing that war was imminent, did a preemptive strike into this area of Egypt, attacking the Egyptians. The very same day that they started war right here, the Syrians and the people of Jordan invaded Israel on this side. It was a six-day war on both sides of this nation. Miraculously, within six days, Israel had won. Not only had they won, next slide, they took all this territory. Boom. Six days, Israel's a beast. Okay? <laughs> Arab nations on the left and the right and the north, all right, even coming up from the south, and Israel just destroys them. This is now Israel after the 1967 war. They have taken the Sinai Peninsula. They have the Gaza Strip. They have everything in here, the West Bank. They control Jerusalem. They got the Golan Heights. The Arab countries were not happy. Six years later, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, when all the people of Israel are fasting, it's the most holy day of the year, the Arab nations once again attack. They attack, but once again, their attack is fruitless. While Israel doesn't gain any territory in the war, their borders remain about the same. Right here is the Suez Canal. That's another very important place uh, back in the history. So Israel is just strong. And they're growing stronger and stronger. And more and more Jews keep coming back to the Holy Land. They keep being gathered back into Israel. So following the war in 1973, rather than doing more wars, the Arab nations start to turn towards peace process. Peace process to get back land. And U.S. president after U.S. president would keep pushing this, saying, Israel, this isn't your land. This isn't your land. This isn't your land. This isn't your land. Give it back. Give it back. Give it back. So Israel would work with this. In 1978, Israel agreed to give all of this land back to Egypt. Egypt became the first Muslim state to recognize Israel as a sovereign state. This created a lot of discord in the Middle East. They all hated Egyptians now because of this. But because Israel gave up this huge chunk of land, Egypt began to give oil to Israel and began to be peaceful towards them. But the other peace processes weren't so kind. Uh, they weren't so good. In 1993, in the Oslo Accords, Israel gave back to the Palestinians, to the Arabs, Gaza and the West Bank. They gave back those, that land for self-governance. They weren't a sovereign state, but they said, look, you can do your own thing there. We're going to do our own thing in here. And they built up walls and barricades uh, along the West Bank and along the Gaza Strip. So that leads us to today. This is present-day Israel. Israel is right here. All right, and then this land is controlled by Israel, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights up here.
but it's land that's mostly settled by Arabs. All right, and it's a very tense area. This is what the Palestinians want to claim as their own land, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. All right, so it's mostly Arabs, it's mostly Palestinians living in these sections, whereas it's Jews, mostly Jews living in this section right here. That's present day Israel. Who's from New Jersey in here? New Jersey. All right, New Jersey is the same size as Israel. <laughs> Israel is about 20,000 kilometers square. Korea is about 100,000 kilometers square. So Israel would be about a fifth of Korea. Iran is 80 times the size of Israel. So to put that in perspective, I think right here is about 80 people. You guys are all Iran right here, all right? And then Joel right here is Israel. That's it, all right, in terms of size. I want you guys just to know that Israel is not a big land. It's very small. Population is about 8 million. That's 2 million less than just the city of Seoul. 8 million is a small country. But somehow this country keeps surviving. Somehow this, this country, despite having terrorist groups all around it and Muslim nations way around it that absolutely hate it, and like Rona said earlier, want to annihilate it, somehow it keeps surviving. Now Palestine, West Bank, and Gaza Strip, that's about 4.4 million in population. All right, they're mostly Arabs and Muslims living in those lands. Now I've already shared how God's eyes are always on Israel. His heart is for this promised land. His heart is for this specific land. It's what it says in Scripture. His eyes are always on it. But not only are his eyes on it, God also gives specific warnings and curses for anyone who will come against this land, who will come against the land of Israel. So I'm going to give you guys some more verses. All right, we're going to look through these. Ezekiel 38, 16. You will come against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days, I will bring you against my land, that the nations may know me. When through you, O God, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Ezekiel 38, 22 is an important verse. With pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him. And I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples who are with him torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So how is God going to judge the nations that come against Israel? With the weather, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. Take note of that. Judgment, weather. Judgment, weather. Zechariah 2.8. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye, referring to Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye. Zechariah 12. Two and three, behold, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. And all the nations of the earth will gather against it. This is speaking of the end times. All right, how the nations are going to come against Israel. But it says all that try and lift Jerusalem that try and come against this land, they're going to get hurt. Zechariah 12, 6, this is a powerful verse. It says, On that day I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like a flaming torch among sheaves, and they shall devour to the right and to the left all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. Remember the Arab-Israeli war? Who attacked them? Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, okay, from the right. From the left, it was Egypt. From the left and from the right, they were attacked. Israel took care of them both, left and right. 1967, Six-Day War. Once again, they're attacked. Jordan and Syria, from the right. Egypt, uh, from the left. Once again, Israel knocks them out from the right and to the left. How about that? They shall devour to the right and to the left all the surrounding peoples. Powerful verse right there, Zechariah 12, 6. Next one, Zechariah 12, 9. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. See how zealous God is for this land? And he's not joking around. This isn't just one prophet, you know, saying some stuff. And all right, it's just a little footnote. This is throughout scripture. I'm only showing you some of the verses. All right, but this is powerful how much God loves this land. Now, it's clear in scripture, you're not supposed to meddle with this land. 
All right, you're not supposed to meddle with Jerusalem, try and lift it up, try and change the borders, try and change things around. God speaks that there will be punishments for those that do these things. Now, I'm going to list just a few instances of U.S. presidents kind of meddling with this area and what happened on the same day or the day after. You can label these as coincidences, but there have been books written on how many of these coincidences have happened in just the past 20 and 30 years. So follow along here. October 1991, President George H. Bush, the father, the older Bush, promotes the dividing of the land of Israel in exchange for peace of Palestine. So basically, Israel, divide up your land so that the Palestinians will be at peace with you. The very next day, a storm so bizarre, it was labeled the perfect storm, also known as the Halloween storm, okay, hits the northeast of America and causes destruction. The hurricane starts as a storm in the Atlantic and then turns the opposite direction, comes back towards America. Put up, put up this slide here. So jet stream, it goes this way. For whatever reason, the storm is coming out, and then George Bush, President George Bush, starts to make this announcement. The storm decides to turn around. <laughs> Not only does it turn around, it becomes a hurricane, a crazy storm that was so ridiculous, George Clooney made a movie about it called The Perfect Storm. Among the damage... Yeah, George Clooney. All right, among the damage that happened in this storm, among the homes destroyed, was the home of President George H. Bush in Maine. His very home was destroyed by this storm. A year later, on August 23rd, 1992, President Bush decides again, let's try this again. Let's push the agenda of dividing the land of Israel to bring peace to Palestine on August 23rd, 1992. That very night, August 23rd, 1992, Hurricane Andrew smashes into Florida and leaves $30 billion in damage. It's the worst natural disaster to hit America up to that point. This is pretty much every picture that you'll find of Hurricane Andrew. I mean, there's just, there's nothing left. Mass destruction. I remember that. I was 10 years old at that time. Uh, January 16th, 1994. Now we got President Clinton. He meets with Syria's President Hafez el-Assad and discusses a peace agreement that will stipulate Israel giving up land to Syria. Within 24 hours, a 6.9 earthquake hits Southern California. It was the second worst natural disaster in America's history behind Hurricane Andrew. And these pictures from this earthquake, it was a Northridge earthquake uh, in California, are bizarre. All right, you can Google it. Earthquake 1994, weird pictures from this earthquake. Look at that. That's something you see in like that, that rock movie that came out recently, uh, whatever it was. Uh, all right, October 15, 1998, let's move on. Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat and Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu meet in America to discuss Israel giving up 13% of their land. Two days later, while these talks are still in progress, heavy storms and tornadoes hit Texas, with flooding affecting 25% of Texas. The storms left $1 billion in damage. This wasn't just a city that was flooded. 25% of Texas was affected by these floods. Next, George W. Bush, all right, older Bush's son. He pushes a roadmap to peace, as if now he's going to discover peace in the Middle East, with Israel having to evacuate that Gaza Strip that was on the left. On August 23, 2005, ironically, that was the same day as Hurricane Andrew, August 23rd, 2005, um, oh, he pushes this roadmap to, roadmap to peace, and on that date is the last day that Israeli settlers in the, in the Gaza Strip evacuate. So all the Israelis, all the Jews that were living in the Gaza Strip were forced to evacuate. August 23rd marked the last day that one Israeli was left, and he, he had to come out. He was forcibly uh, removed from the Gaza Strip. On that same day, a small tropical storm named Katrina was formed in the Atlantic Ocean. That same day, six days later, it becomes the most destructive hurricane to ever hit America. This is New Orleans. Completely flooded. Completely flooded. My uncle lost everything. Uh, he lived in New Orleans at that time, lost everything. April 19, 2010, we got the next president, Obama. He announces that the U.S. will no longer automatically stand with Israel in the U.N. Security Council decisions. Never before has a U.S. president made such a declaration. We're not going to stand with you anymore, Israel. 
The next day, April 20th, 2010, the deep water horizon explodes and there is a massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. I believe you guys all know about this one. This spill would affect all the surrounding states in the Gulf of Mexico, would kill much wildlife and would cause billions upon billions of dollars in damage. You guys are aware of that one, right? Okay, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, same day. On May 22nd, 2011, President Obama announces that Israel's borders should return to how they were in 1967. Got to go back to that, and Palestine, Palestine should become its own separate state. That very night, destructive tornadoes destroy much of the city of Joplin, Missouri, and tornadoes and hailstorms sweep through Oklahoma and Texas. Guys, if you don't look up pictures from this destruction. It's disgusting. Dead bodies and all, all sorts of junk. Okay, very same day. Those are just a few of the examples. There's plenty more. There's plenty more. I just gave you guys seven. Different presidents of the U.S. meddling in here, trying to get Israel to give up land. And sometimes Israel was willing. Other times Israel was totally against what they were saying. But with every time, some sort of consequence would follow. God's love never fails. God's word never fails. God cares for this land, and God cares for his people. And something you guys need to do when you read the Old Testament, and there are promises given to Israel in the Old Testament, is you need to ask yourself, has this been fulfilled? Has this been fulfilled? And as you begin to pray and meditate through the scripture, your heart's going to start to be stirred, because you're going to realize God has so much more in, in store for Israel and for this world. If Isaiah 66, that one verse that said a nation could be born in a day that was made 2,000, probably 2,700 years earlier, could be fulfilled in our you know, parents' lifetime or our grandparents' lifetime, imagine what's going to happen in our lifetime. I'll give you an example. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and say to each, each to his brother, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the lord for i will forgive their iniquity and i will remember their sin no more guys his covenant with israel and with judah has yet to be fulfilled but it will happen god is true to his promises isaiah 54 verse 10 for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed says the lord who has compassion on you. I want to ask Susie to come up, and I want to close with this. I've given you guys a lot of practical history. I hope you guys now know where the Gaza Strip is, where the West Bank is. I hope you guys now understand that Israel, the land of Israel, was not always Muslim, and it was not always Jewish. All right, It's always been a mix of Jews, of Muslims, and of Christians in that land. Palestine was a name given to the land, not as a nationality and an ethnicity, but just as a label of this is the area, just like we say the Middle East, but we're not referring to one country. These are things that you guys need to know just in terms of sorting through all the news, because a lot of the news is biased one way where it's pro-Israel and another way where it's pro-Palestine. You guys got to find out the truth in it. And you got to know how to pray. But I want to bring it back to scripture and God's heart. Joseph. Joseph in the Bible was one of the clearest pictures of Jesus that we see in the Old Testament. His life paralleled Jesus almost to a T. Joseph was loved by his father, chosen by his father, adored by his father, but he was hated by his brothers. And he was rejected and betrayed by his brothers for silver. They sold him for silver. And he was taken to Egypt and he was tempted, and then he was wrongfully imprisoned. But when Joseph was released out of prison, he became the source of deliverance, not just for Egypt, but for all the surrounding nations. 
during the famine. Later, Joseph's brothers would be gathered back to him, but they wouldn't recognize him. They wouldn't know who he was. And before he revealed himself to them, they went through some trials and tribulation. They went through some struggles. But Joseph, he couldn't hold back his love for them. And at one point, he just broke. And he wept. And he wept before them as he revealed himself to them. And he cried for them so loudly that Pharaoh of Egypt and all the other officials could hear him. So big was Joseph's heart for his brothers, despite all the evil that they had done to him. See, when Jesus came, his heart was for Israel. His heart was for the Jews. He says, I've come for the lost sheep. I've come for the sons of Abraham. I've come for you. And even though they rejected him, they were filled with jealousy in front of him and envy. And they hated him. They mocked him. And they crucified him. He still longs for them. And there is going to be a day where his brothers are going to be gathered back to him, just like Joseph's brothers were gathered back to him. And there will be trials, there will be tribulations before this time. But when he reveals himself, they will all know him, they will all be reconciled to him, and they will know the power of love. And the love for the Jewish people doesn't stop with Jesus, it doesn't stop with God. Go to Romans 10 one more time. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. This was coming from a man who had been stoned by the Jews twice. This is coming from a man who had been whipped by the Jews and had been in prison for a big portion of his life. This is coming from a man who had saved all these different people and the Jews out of jealousy would come in and mess up their beliefs and cast Paul out of the land. Paul didn't forsake them. Just as Jesus didn't forsake his people, Paul would not forsake his family. Even though they were so wicked to him, he said, I wish I was accursed if they might just know the Lord because so great is God's love for his people. So great is his love for Israel. His promises that make up a greater portion of this scripture than the New Testament are letters of love for Israel, crying out for Israel to recognize their God, to come back to their God, to love their God. And I'm telling you, church, if you get into God's heart, if you ask God, give me a heart for the orphans, he'll give you a heart for the orphans. You ask for God for a heart for the victims of injustice, he'll give you a heart for the victims of injustice. But man, if you ask for a heart for Israel, you better be ready because his heart burns for Israel. It doesn't matter what they've done. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not even one. We've tasted grace, haven't we? All of us were sinners. All of us have done wrong and are deserving of hell. And yet God in his grace chose us. Now his love is great for choosing us. But the very people that crucified him, his love burns for as well. And guys, when you start to connect with God's heart for Israel, you start to realize a love that goes beyond anything of this world that makes no sense. The fact that God would love you is ridiculous, but the fact that God would love Israel and burn for them for all of time, it's incomprehensible. Praying for Israel is not just, God, I wanna pray because you care. Praying for Israel is, God, I wanna know your heart more. Your love is ridiculous. I don't understand why you're choosing these people. They've done so much wrong for so long. They were jealous of you. They mocked you. They crucified you. They hated you and your people. And yet you keep on loving them. You care for them. You yearn for them. You weep for Jerusalem. This is why we pray for Israel, church. We want to connect with the heart of God. And there is so much more. To, to be said, guys. This message is just another piece. There's so much more to be said of why we pray for Israel, but I want you guys to catch this tonight. God's love never fails. His promises will be fulfilled for Israel. He is true to his promises. I want us to pray. Guys, I want us to pray that God would give us his heart for Israel. And I want us to pray that we'll get the same spirit as Paul. 
that though he was in prison for most of his life, though he was shipwrecked, though he was stoned multiple times, though he was whipped and flogged multiple times because of the jealousy of the Jews, he kept yearning for them. He kept crying for them. He kept writing love and praying for them. And this is the heart that God wants to give us. So right now, church, let's pray. God, give me a heart for Israel. God, help me understand your love for them. This love that is incomprehensible. God, give it to me. This love that is eternal. This love that no matter what wrong they've done, you've just chosen them. And you love them because you love them because you love them. It's not a conditional love. It's a choice that you have made. And I want to understand it. I want to get in it. Give me a heart for your people. Let's pray, church. Let's pray for Israel. And, and what was preached in my first message about praying for Israel and what Pastor Christian also preached very clearly in the future of Israel. Israel is key for the end times. Israel is key. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Who, what did the early church, what was it made up of? Completely Jews. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And the Spirit of God has been moving Spirit of God has been moving west throughout, throughout centuries, throughout millenniums. It's been moving west, and it's coming back to Asia, coming up through Australia. The Spirit of God is returning to Israel. And Jesus says, you will not see me again until Jerusalem says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jerusalem is key. Israel is key. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. There has been a partial hardening upon the house of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles, until the gospel has been preached to all the earth, and then that hardening is going to be lifted. That promise of Jeremiah 31, they will all know me, is going to be fulfilled, and Jesus is going to return. He's going to return for his family, for us, for his beloved descendants of Abraham. Guys, I want us to pray for Israel. It's key that we are praying for Messianic Jews. A Messianic Jew is a Jew, a son of Abraham, that has confessed that Jesus is the Savior. He is the Messiah. They have put their faith in him and become a Christian. Messianic Jew. Guys, we want to pray that as the Jews are returning to Israel and fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament, that these Jews may come to know the Lord. That in Jerusalem, they may say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to Jesus, their Messiah. We want to see the kingdom of Israel be known as the kingdom of God once again. So let's pray for Israel. Let's pray for the revelation of Jesus. Let's pray for the revelation of the Messiah in that land, for Messianic Jews to be raised up. Let's pray, church.